Okay, so we were discussing um, the mistake that we can't be smarter than Hashem, that he, the both the land, Adam, you know, they said, oh, we're just going to copy Hashem. Hashem told us, you know, Hashem decided to save the light for when Mashiach comes for later. And I can also do the very same. Um, so that's, that's when Hashem explicitly, even if you think this is the perfect gift for somebody, this is the perfect way to serve, if Hashem explicitly tells you otherwise, then we know that we have to follow that. So Hashem gives us exactly the way we need. So we're going to discuss right now, how come the land was different before and after the sin? So we said that that was one of the punishments that the land is now going to have, um, the land is going to have the thorns and the thistles and it's going to be very difficult to work. And so our question is, was this a punishment or was it cause and effect? So sometimes, let's just say a person you know, eats a certain food and they get a stomach ache from it. That's not a punishment. That's just a cause and effect. You did A, this food is not, doesn't agree with you. So now you have your stomach ache, right? I didn't clean up. Now it's messy. You know, I didn't take care of it. Now it got moldy. Now it got ruined. So that's our question. Is this a punishment or is this a, uh, just a consequence, a cause and effect? So when the world was created, the Shekhinah, which is Hashem's divine presence in this world, that was down below in this world. And it brought in the, the land naturally created produce without defects, produce that was perfect, fruits that were perfect. They had no blemishes. They had no defects. And grains that did not have any coarse parts that needed to be separated out of them. And they didn't need any work. Everything just grew perfect. Not like now where you have to, you have the good and the bad and you have to sift out whether, you know, you're talking about the grains and, you know, you have to sift it out or whether you're talking about, you know, the, the produce, there's certain parts that get rotten. If you just leave those, they're going to cause the rest of the things to get rotten. And we have, there's weeds that you have to pull out to allow things to grow more properly. So when, when the Jewish, when Adam and Chava sinned, the Shekhinah, which is Hashem's divine presence, ascended up to heaven because the earth was not fit for this. Now that it became impure, well, Hashem's presence cannot dwell in a place that is so impure. That was not appropriate. It couldn't handle that, right? It's just like you have boiling, boiling hot water. You can't put in a thin little <laughs> something with such high energy. So that's that's what was going on over here. They Excuse say, me, Deborah. Could you please mute the people? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, sure. That's okay. Thank you. Is that better? Okay. So now what happened, I'm so used to noise, I didn't even notice it. <laughs> okay, so now what happened was, since they sinned, now they're not a proper vessel for holiness. And the holiness isn't comfortable. The holiness can't stay there. And so the holiness ascended all the way up to heaven. And that's what was going on. They did not, the, the Shechina had left. In addition to the Shekhinah, Hashem's divine presence, leaving this world, leaving down here the physical world that we're in, where Adam and Chava were. In addition to that, we have that a spirit of Tuma, which is impurity, came onto the land. And now earth is filled with this impurity. So now it's a cause and effect. It's not punishment that the land yes we said he did wrong but it was an automatic result of his own action because what happened the land did not listen to Hashem so now it's not a, and Adam and Chava didn't listen so now the land is not 
fit to hold such holiness. And therefore, it now has evil. So everything it produces is going to be a mixture of good and evil. So therefore, it's going to have good fruits, but it's also going to be mixed with the defects, and we're going to need to separate it. And spiritually, it's the same also. That just like the physical things, it's a mixture, and you need to pull out, you know, we have fruit and produce that we need to separate and pull out the good from the, you know, things that are not so good and that could be damaging it. It's the same thing spiritually. With all our materialistic things in this world, with everything that we have, our bodies and the objects around us, whether it's our house and our car, um, the wood, the trees, whatever it is around us, nature, everything around us, that these things are a mixture of good and bad. Since this sin, everything is a mixture of good and bad. And because that's what they did. That's what Adam and Chava wanted to do, bring the good and bad so we could choose the good. So now we're left with that. Everything has the, it's something good, but it has a defect. And we have to make sure to separate. And we have to pull out all those weeds. And we have to make sure that we're only using the good. So we need to, pull out the spark in Kedusha. How do you do that? Well, let's say I'm lighting the Shabbos candles. I take a candle. I light it at the right time before sunset. And I say the blessing, or even if I don't I have in mind, this is to bring in the Shabbos. Even if I don't have intention, but I'm lighting it for Shabbos, automatically I am separating and I'm letting that spark of holiness come out and be separated from the klipa from this shell of darkness that is hiding over and not allowing that godliness to shine. So that, that's what we do. This is our constant, you know, the earth on one hand is literally the earth. And literally the earth, we know that's why, you know, we have to, some people spray the vegetables, some people want organic, but you always have to be still be separating the weeds and, you know, and some things become rotten and we don't just get everything perfectly good. You don't have a tree that everything is just good. You have to work at it and you have to, you have to work. That's the bottom line. You got to sow, you got to plow, you got to, you got to do all the work and you got to pull out the weeds and pull out what's not good. So it's the same thing. The, the earth doesn't just mean the physical earth. It also means all our physicality. It's symbolic of everything in this physical world. So everything in this physical world, we have to work and pull out the good and leave the not good aside. And we do that through doing mitzvahs. Like we said, if you like the Shabbos candle, let's say I want to eat something. I take an apple. I say a bracha. I say the blessing. I recognize that it's from Hashem. I use the energy afterwards to say a nice comment to someone, to learn some taira, to pray, whatever it may be. That is how I elevate the spark of holiness and release it and separate it from the impurity. So if we look in um, the passage, it says in the passage that Bekor Vidardar Tatsmiach Lucha, which we read in last class. And it seems to be saying Tatsmiach means you will plant. So it seems to be saying like you will plant thorns and thistles. So why would we actually plant thorns and thistles? So it says, no, it means you will plant, comma, even though you're going to plant and you're trying to plant good produce, thorns and thistles are going to come out. You're going to plant A, but B is going to come out. You're going to plant all your nice seeds to get your beautiful plants and trees. And you might get some of those, but you're also going to get thorns and thistles in addition to that. Sometimes completely instead and nothing comes out of that seed and sometimes, you know, in addition. And it ends off, you're going to have to eat the grass of the field. This actually seems positive. Oh, you're going to eat the grass. That's good. But it says, meaning, no, you're going to have to eat grass, herbs, because of a lack of an alternative. You're not going to have other good foods. You're just going to have so minimal. 
Um, and we're going to have to sweat. We're going to have to work really, really hard. Okay, so now we're going to move on to, we're going to move on to the next, um, the next part, the next and last and final uh, section of this topic. And the next and final section is talking about, the next and final section is talking about Adam naming Chava. And it's also talking about them being dismissed from the Garden of Eden. So we spoke about how did they actually come to sin? Why did they want to come to sin? The actual sin. And then we spoke about their punishments, the consequences for this. So we pretty much finished up the story, except for them going, you know, going out. So now, okay, this is where we're up to. Man names Chava. Could everyone see the screen? Okay. Vayikra Adam Shem Ishtai, and the man called the name of his wife Chava. Aim Kol Chai. So he calls her, he gives her this name of Chava, and the man names his wife Eve, because she was the mother of all life. Okay? So this is what we're going to discuss right now. And our question, he names her the name Chava because she was the mother of all life. So our question becomes, is the naming a result of this sin? In other words, now that she's sinned, now she's deserving of this name, which is, you know, the mother of all life. Did this come right afterwards? Like, oh, they sinned. And then he said, oh, I have to give a name to my wife. Is this the, the real sequence of events of how it happened? And the answer is no, it's not. Really, the sin came after Chava was created and named. She was named, Adam named all the animals, and then she was named afterwards. But it interrupts this whole story and this whole series of events before saying the naming of Chava with the story of the sin. So now we're going back to what we were in the middle of. In other words, we're in the middle of this story that he's naming the animals and he's about to name Chava and it comes and says, oh, wait, I just want to tell you about this story of the sin. And then it goes back to name her. So the question becomes, why? Why is the tyrant interrupting and not continuing with the story of naming Chava and feeling it's so necessary to tell about their sin in the middle of all of this? And the answer is because Adam, since Adam was naming the animals, he, as he was naming them, each one had a pair. And he said, wait a second, I'm so lonely. How come I don't have a pair? And so Hashem put him to sleep and he created Chava from him. And then, so now he was in the middle of naming the animals and then Hashem gives him Chava, his partner. And so they, they're a couple now and they were together as a couple. They were having the intimate relations as we said, before, you know, the beginning and introduction to this topic, that the two of them were together as a couple and the serpent, you know, the snake saw Chava unclothed because they were in the middle of intimate relations and he desired Chava. So that's why it's putting it here because this, it's because of Adam naming the animals that this whole story happened because he was naming the animals. He got Chava and he was together with Chava and the snake saw and tried to get them to sin. Because don't forget, as we said in a previous class, they were commanded this much earlier in the day, but now is after Chava came into the picture, that's when the snake enticed and that's when they fell into the trap and had the desire and wanted to eat from the tree and actually sin. So now let's talk about the name a little bit. 
why did Adam give her this name? What does it mean? So Rashi explains that Chava is like Chaya. And what does Chaya mean? Chai. I'm sure most of you know. What does the word Chai mean? Anybody want to share? It means life. 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 Exactly. So she gives life, as the passage just told us, Aim Kol Chai. She is the mother of all life. She gives life. She's the mother. A mother gives life to a child. She's the matriarch. She's the first mother, the first person to give life, if not for her. Right? It's a, it's a continuation. It's a chain. And so if you don't have the top, we don't, if we don't have Chava, we don't have us. We're all a result of Chava. So she gives life to all children. It says that the, if you look at the word Chava, okay, and maybe I'll share screen here so I can, so I could, um, you know, draw for you. So if you take the word Chava, okay, this is how we write Chava. And then you take the word Chaya. So the Ches is the same, and it's just a Yud instead of the He. Okay, so we have over here, the difference is that this is a Vav. A Vav is the sixth letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And Yud is the 10th. It has the numeric value, it's 10. Okay, so bearing that in mind, that Chava is spelled with the Vav. This is the Vav. Okay, this is the Vav. And its numeric value is six. And Chaya is spelled with the Yud, whose numeric value is 10. Okay. And so Adam gives her this name and he is substituting the Yud, the 10, with the Vav, the six. So there's two reasons. The first reason Rashi gives is more simple. And he says, because when you have a word, they're interchangeable and the Vav and the Yud could mean the same thing. For those of you who speak a little bit of Hebrew, like you could say, Hove, or you could say, Haya. You could, if you put the Vav, it means, Hove means now, present, I mean like constant, I'm constantly doing that. Haya is past, it already, it already happened. So, what, what's going on over here? He's, he's saying that I want the Vav where it's constant. She's always the mother for mankind, not she was the mother. You always owe gratitude to your mother. You always owe, owe gratitude to your grandmother and your great-grandmother, even if they're presently not in your life today and they've passed on. Okay, so she is constantly, she's always the mother of all mankind. That's the first reason. The second reason is from the al -Sheikh. And this is the, the idea that we said that the, the Vav is six and the Yud is 10. So he says, no, you won't be Chaya anymore with the Yud, 10. We're going to switch it to a six. If you do 10, Minus six, everyone put up your fingers. How much do you have if you do 10 minus six? How many fingers am I going to have if I have 10? Four. And I took away six, I have four. four left. So we're left with the number four. So what is the four symbolic of? It says that there's something called the Arba Yesaides, the four elements. And everything on earth is made up of four elements. Does anyone know what these four elements are? These four elements are Esh, Ruach, Mayim, and Afar. Esh, fire, water, dust or earth, and wind. And every person, every body consists of these four things, and they're united 
while the person is alive, and we have these different elements and that keeps us alive as a person. And when someone passes away, these elements are separated and they go back to earth. And so it says she is not deserving to have that good. She has to go down. We took away the four elements from her because she brought death into this world and she caused those four elements are not going to be everlasting. They're going to have to go back to earth when a person passes away. So since the, she caused these four elements to be lost by people, that's why we switched it from a 10 to a six, minusing those four elements. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to the next part. And this is that Hashem banishes man out of the Garden of Eden. And let's read the passages and then we'll go into it. Vayas Hashem alikim la'adam ul'ishtai chosnais or vayal bishem. And Hashem made for Adam and his wife shirts of skin and he dressed them. Vayoymer Hashem alikim and Hashem, God said, Hain ha'adam haya ka'achad menu. Behold, man has come like one of us above here, meaning myself and the angels. Ladas Taibira, having the ability of knowing good and evil. Naata now pen yishlach yadai, lest he will send his hand and take also from the tree of life. And what's going to happen if he eats from the tree of life? He'll eat and he'll live forever. When you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and bad, you've got the knowledge of good and bad. And now if you eat from the tree of life, you're going to live forever. So he makes some clothing to get them ready for getting out into the real world. And he says... You came too similar to us up here, knowing too much information. And now you might also take from the tree of life, and I'm going to get you out of here before you do so. And Pasach of Gimel, verse 23. And Hashem sent him out of the garden of Eden. To serve the earth. That he was taken from there. Right, Hashem sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the soil whence he had been taken. And he drove the man out. Sorry, and he stationed from the east of the Garden of Eden. What did he place on the east of the Garden of Eden and the entrance? The Kruvim. The ace lahat hacherev hamis hapeches, and the blade of the revolving sword. Why lishmar esterech it chayim to guard the way to the tree of life. So he kicks them out of the Garden of Eden, and then he puts the kruvim and this blade this sword that's just revolving around to guard them so they won't come in. Why doesn't he want them to come in? Because he does not want them to eat from, can anyone answer that for me? What doesn't he want them to have now to eat from? He's not worried about the, the tree of good and evil because they already ate from that and they already you know, have this ability to know evil. So what is he worried about? Did anyone pick that up? The tree of life. The tree of life. Exactly. So we're first going to go into the Pasuk of Aleph, the first verse, and then we'll get to the tree of life and discuss that. So it says that Hashem made them clothing. Kasnas Ar, he made them clothing of skin. So there's two opinions as to what type of clothing he made, because it says 
The question is, is it clothing for the skin or is it clothing of skin? When it says kosnais or clothing of skin, it could mean clothing for the skin or it could mean clothing made out of skin. So Rashi actually explains that there is, well, let's hear what everyone, what does everyone think? Do you think it's it's clothing for the skin or do you think it's clothing made out of the skin? For the skin or made out of the skin? Okay, good vote, Nomi. Anyone else voting? For the skin. I said for the skin. For the skin, okay. Well, everybody's right because there's two opinions. Lucky, see one person, two opinions. Two Jews, three opinions. Okay, so um, Rashi explains that there's two opinions. Either it could be clothing for the skin, and that means smooth like nails and very like clinging to the body. You know, like your skin is smooth and it's very close to the body. And it says it's pretty like pearls. Oh, and I like can't hear you. I'm sorry. Okay, I thought there was a question. I guess not. Okay, so um, so that's this was clothing for the skin that was very uh, soft and smooth. It says smooth like nails, and you know very close and comfortable. And the second opinion that Rashi brings is that it was made from skin like fur, like rabbit's fur that was soft and warm. So there's different opinions of exactly what the clothing was like, but everybody agrees that it was clothing, you know, that was now, now they would be clothed. So that's about the clothing. Now let's go, and this is an important lesson. He's about to send them out, not in the Garden of Eden where God is there and talking to you and protecting you. The real world, the real world that we all live in. And what does he say? What does he do before he sends them out to this world? He puts on clothing. We've spoken about clothing before. What are the two? What are the two functions of clothing? What two purposes does clothing hold? Does anyone remember from some of our previous classes the two functions of clothing? Um, would it be like to protect the body and maybe beautify it? Maybe I got one out of two right. <laughs> Excellent. Protect the body 100%. And the second one could also be right because it's to express the body. So if you're wearing beautiful clothing, it's to beautify and to express it. If I'm, you know, if a child is in like a rebellious mood and, you know, so they're going to put on, you know, more tough clothes. If you're going to work at a certain place, they're gonna want you to be very neat. If you're in the army, you gotta cut your hair short or put it back or you know, dress more. And you know, your clothing has to be you know, more fit if you're gonna work. It depends where you're working, right? You can't dress the same. If you're out on the field, if you're in sports, you're gonna dress one way. If you're going to a wedding, so it expresses. So before Hashem sent them out into this world, he says, you need clothing. You need to protect yourself. You're going out into the world where everything's in front of you. You can't just go. You need protection. And you also need to be thinking, how do I want to be expressing myself? And that's something we have to constantly ask ourselves because every day we wake up in this world that they were sent out to and we have to say, how am I going to protect myself? Am I going to pray in the morning before I start my day? Am I going to have a Torah thought? Am I going to, you know, say, Hashem, I'm showing you gratitude. How am I going to protect myself and fortify myself to go out into the world? And then how do I want to express myself? You know, if you um, fail to plan, you plan to fail. Like if you, you have to be conscious about the way that you want to express yourself. And then you can be in control and have much more success. So we do have the power. But Hashem is giving us a little message, like you want to be successful in that world where you have free choice to choose between good and bad. It's not so easy, but 
the clothing, which of course being modest in itself definitely protects you. You're much less vulnerable when you're you know, modest and you have privacy. That's something in this world that's becoming less, um, less of the norm, you know, to be private. But clothing keeps you private, you know, keep your space, but also think, and, and you know, how am I going to protect? How am I going to express myself? Okay, so now we're going to go on to the next verse, Pasach Habiz, where Hashem said, now you're going to become like Hashem. You're going to become, un- and what did he mean by that? He said, you're going to be unique. Hashem is unique in the higher worlds. He knows more than everybody else. And now you are going to be unique in the lower worlds. Why is man going to be unique down here in the lower worlds? because you know good and bad. And the animals and everything else don't. So it's only you, the human, that knows good and bad. And that all the animals and everything else doesn't. So you are, it's not that you're like God and now the human Adam and Chava are on the level of Hashem. They're not. But he's saying you are unique and higher than everyone else in your world, just like I am unique and higher than everyone else. So I'm higher than everyone else in all worlds, but you are higher than everyone else down um, below because you're now have such a different stature than all the other creations in the world. So you need to leave. And why do you need to leave? As Amy and Essa told us, you need to leave because I don't want you to eat from the tree of life, from the Eitz HaChayim. I don't want you to leave there because then you're going to live forever. And the question is, why is it so bad if he lives forever? And he said, that's going to be very misleading because people are going to think, oh, he's forever. He's like God. And there's only one Hashem in the world and no one else could be like Hashem. And he doesn't want anyone it to be misleading and anyone to think that he is like Hashem. Now, our question becomes, how come they didn't die that day? What were we told? We were told in chapter 2, Whoever has their homish, they could open up to their chapter two. We opened it up a few times already. Chapter two, verse 17, it said, if, if you eat from this, you're going to die on this day. So our question is, why, why is it kicking them out? Why aren't they being killed? And we know that Adam lived over 900 years. So what's going on over here? So as we learned in the first class in the introduction to the whole book of Bereshis, we said that Hashem, for Hashem, a day is like a thousand years. For a human, a day is 24 hours. So he is going according to his day. You're going to die on this day, meaning sometime during this thousand years, before the thousand years are up. And certainly that's what happened. So Hashem's day is a thousand years and a person's day is one day as we know it, 24 hours. And if you sin on purpose, then you are treated like a person on the level of a person and then it's dying within the same day. But if one does it which means by accident, not on purpose, then we go according to Hashem's day, which is a thousand years. And Adam and Chava, they did not, they sinned, it was by accident, right? The snake pushed them, they didn't really know what they were eating, they didn't know what they were getting into, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, why shouldn't Adam live forever? So we discuss this a little bit, but now we're going to add a deeper element of Hasidus to it. 
and understand it a little deeper. Does anyone have any opinions on why Adam and Chava should not live forever? What would be the problem with them living forever? Why doesn't Hashem want that? Well, if they live it forever, then it seems like they're more of a celestial being. Okay, okay. So similar to what we had what we had mentioned earlier. Good, that's a good point. So Hasidus explains that as a result of the sin, what happened? What did we say happened as a result of the sin? Bad came into the world. Right? We discussed that. So that's why the Shechina, that's why Hashem's divine presence had to leave the world because it, you know, bad came into the world and sort of like kicked it out. And now they have, you know, the knowledge of good and bad. And now there's death in the world, right? That's one of the things of bad. We have choices to misuse things and to use them not to serve Hashem, to rebel against Hashem, to hurt other people. You know, the list goes on and on and on. And so now that they had bad, he doesn't want them to live together in this form of having bad. So he says it's necessary for them to die so that they could be recreated perfect. And it actually says that before Mashiach comes, the El Ha'afer Tashav, and to the ground you will, start, you will return, that everyone is supposed to be buried uh, you know, in the earth. That's the way that, that a person is, is buried. And, and people, so it says that everyone is going to have to die before Mashiach comes, because this is what we're saying now, that Hashem doesn't want us to be in the form of our bodies, which are good and bad. And therefore, he wants us to be recreated. And so people have this fear, oh, when Mashiach comes, I'm, you know, even if I'm alive, We'll say, you know, people are going to have to die before Mashiach comes. But um, Lubavitcher Rebbe gives an explanation, and he explains that Ve'el Ha'afer Tashuv, to return to the dust, doesn't have to be literal, that a person has to be buried in the dust, but it could mean that you act like the dust. Each of the four elements that we discussed earlier fire, water, um, wind, and earth, there's different elements that a person behaves. Like when you're with the element of fire, a fire is like very warm and going upwards and a lot of energy and warmth. And that's serving God with like a blazing love and warmth. And when we talk about water, water flows downward. And each one has a different element that we serve Hashem with. And one of the things that the earth is symbolic of is the idea of earth is the lowest. And so it says, this is serving Hashem with humility. And how do we do teshuva? How do we repent and turn back to Hashem? We repent and turn back to Hashem through Bittal through, hum through humility. Because when someone says, I did nothing wrong, I'm the greatest, they can't repent. Repentance means I admit what I did was wrong and I'm not going to do it again and I'm put in the situation and I change and I do it again. And so and so egotistical cannot change. So, in order to change, we discuss this in other classes, what do we need to do, Chuva? We need that sense of humility. I was wrong. I'm sorry. I could change. And so the Rebbe says that it doesn't mean that we have to actually die, but it means that we are going to all do teshuva and have a certain sense of humility before Mashiach comes. Okay, so now back to what we were saying, that he doesn't want Adam to live forever in this state of having evil in him. 
but he, so therefore, if he eats from a tree of life, he's going to live forever in this form of having bed. And he wants instead that he should work on himself, purify himself, elevate himself, and then, you know, uh, live forever once he is refined and elevated. When Mashiach comes, that's the idea that we're going to be refined and elevated when Mashiach comes and live forever then. And it actually says that after everyone's resurrected, they're going to roll, if they are buried outside of Israel, they'll roll all the way to Israel. And then in Israel, they're going to get back their neshama in Jerusalem, in Yerushalayim, because that's going to be recreated in a way that it could last forever. And so Hashem wants us, wants our neshamas to be recreated in a city that's going to last forever with this extra holiness and energy. So, so that's, that's the idea. He can't live forever in this state. He's going to be recreated and live forever when the sheikh comes. So why did Hashem even create this tree? This tree has all the secrets of Tyra. And does anyone have a question? Like, Adam and Chava were told not to eat from this tree of good and bad. And there was also this tree of life. Is, is anyone wondering about anything? But if they would have waited until they were allowed, wasn't Hashem going to allow them to eat from it? Yes. Why didn't Hashem want them to eat from, why didn't Adam want to eat from this tree? Hashem told him. In other words, he could have eaten from this tree and had all the knowledge of Tyra. If he would have eaten from this tree, then you say, fine, he ate from this tree and then maybe he figured, okay, I need more. But like, why not start with this? This sounds like pretty powerful, pretty amazing. Why not? Why didn't he eat from the tree of life? And it says that the reason that Adam didn't want to is for a very similar and same reason why he ate from the tree of knowledge. Who remembers why did Chava eat and then subsequently Adam eat from the tree of knowledge? Why? What did? What was their goal? We said we gave many different reasons, but what was like the main theme that we've had throughout of their goal of eating from this tree of good and bad? Why did they want to do that? The, the, because they wanted to have that challenge of free choice. Summer. Exactly. They wanted to have the challenge that I'm going to choose the good over the bad. If I only have good, there's no challenge. There is no school. Um, it's hard to hear you. I'm sorry. Esther. Okay. So... So for the very same reason, they didn't want to eat from this tree. They didn't want, Adam did not want to just get all this as a gift. He wanted, could anyone guess what he wanted? Following the same theme that Amy just told us, that he wanted the challenge. That's why he wanted to eat from the tree of life. For the very same reason, he did not want to eat from Sorry, that's why I wanted to, he didn't want to eat from the tree of good and bad, the tree of knowledge, for the very same reason he did not want to eat from the tree of life. So why didn't he want to eat from the tree of life? Who thinks they could put the two pieces together now? Anyone think they could connect the dots? He didn't want to eat from the tree of good and bad because he wanted that challenge to pick good over bad, to work hard and do it. And for the very same reason, he wanted effort and toil in Tyra. He didn't want to just know all the secrets of Tyra. He wanted to work on it and learn and figure it out and earn it and toil in it. And that's, what, that's the way we're supposed to do with Tyra. We're supposed to learn Tyra. Constantly learning more and delving into it and trying to figure things out and toil. 
that's 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 the word that we're using over here. Now, they needed to repent to get rid of this sin, and they couldn't just cover it up with learning lots of Tyra. So this also connects why Hashem didn't want him to then eat from the tree of life now. He said, okay, he didn't want him to live forever because he didn't want him to have this mixture of bad. But also connected to this, he is saying, I don't want you now just to eat and get all this tire knowledge and just cover up the sin that you did and push the sin aside and pretend that the sin didn't happen because I'm just going to overpower it now and have so much Tyra all over the place. Sometimes you need to do Teshuvah. It's not good enough just to add in. Sometimes it's good instead of, you know, saying, oh, I need to fight this. Just, you know, focus on the good and do the good and, you know, the rest will kind of disappear. It says a little bit of light dispels a lot of darkness. Just bring light and the darkness will go away. But when you want to do teshuva and you really want to repent, and you really regret something. And here they did do a sin and they were supposed to repent, not just add in the Tyra. Sometimes you're not ready. So first add in the Tyra and then you could repent. But where they, they needed Teshuva to get rid of the sin. Just learning Tyra alone was not going to get rid of the sin. And you can't just do other Tyra mitzvahs to you need to address your mistake, which we discussed um, in previous classes. We discussed this idea that if you want to do teshuva for a specific sin, let's say a person sinned in the idea of kosher food, then you need to do teshuva in that area of kosher food. You can't say, okay, so now I'm going to strengthen my charity because, you know, I mean, charity actually, maybe it's not such a good example because it says that charity can repent, you know, for everything because the when you earn money, you put your whole body into it. And so when you're giving your money, it's like as if you're giving your whole body. But let's just say a person, you know, was not careful with kosher and then they just say, okay, now I'm going to be modest. That's great. Meaning, and that's still better than nothing. And for sure, you know, adding in anything. And if you're not ready to work on what you send in, but ultimately, if you really want to do teshuva, if you really want to fix that sin, it has to be, you said, it's admitting that you did it. It's regretting that you did it. And then it's coming accepting on the future, I'm not going to do it again. And then actually being in that situation, similar, you know, the same idea, the same challenge and overcoming that challenge. So it was the idea, Hashem is saying, you can't just learn Tyra and continue and just do good. You have to address the issue of your mistake and you need to do Teshuvah and you need to repent. And then in the last passage, we were discussing that there is the blade that revolving sword that just is there. And so we, it has the Kruvim and the revolving blade. And the purpose of these are to scare men from entering into Gan Eden. So that's what it says. That right after he kicked him out, it says that by the east side of Gan Eden, which was the entrance, he put the Kruvim, and he put this, a flame of this rotating sword. And it says, why? Lishmar esterach itzachayim. To guard them from coming to the tree of life. And it says that the kruvim was really angels. And the sword was actually like a physical sword that was preventing anybody from coming. And it says that, Hasidus explains that even though um, it says there's a deeper meaning and it says, what's the deeper meaning that the sword was made out of fire. We just said, and fire, interestingly enough, we just brought in fire as being like a fiery, you know, love to Hashem. but all those four elements have a positive side and a negative side. So the positive side is this flaming fire and, you know, close connection to Hashem. And the negative side of fire is ego, gaiva. And it says that someone with arrogance, 
lives with the sword and they can't stand anyone else's existence. It's all about me and I'm the best and I don't want anyone to be better than me. And so, you know, that, that's, the, that, that's the symbol of this. These are two things that prevent someone from going into Gun Eden. So the first one is this sword of fire because fire is like arrogance and ego and arrogance and ego is going to be your sword. It's going to prevent you from going into Gun Eden. It doesn't because you don't allow other people to come and you don't allow Hashem. And you can't admit that what you did was wrong. And so you can improve yourself and you can, you know, be kind to others, etc. So that's what the sword is symbolic of. And the second thing is, and that's something we have to work on. If we want to go to Gan Eden, we want to prepare ourselves to be ready for Mashiach, we need to work on not having arrogance, but rather having bittel, having a sense of humility. And then that makes us less judgmental. That makes us say, it's not about what I want. It's about what Hashem wants. So even though maybe for me, it's more convenient not to eat this or not to, you know, give this charity, I'd rather spend it on something for myself or I, why should I keep shops? I'd rather just, you know, go to a Broadway show tonight and saying, no, I'm going to humble myself. I'm not, it's not, it's not all about me. It's about what does Hashem want? What does this other person need? It's not just about what I, so between us and Hashem and between us and other people, this humility really lets us grow and do mitzvahs. And the second one we said was the Kruvim, which is the Malachim. And the idea of the Malachim is this idea of indulgence, that, that Malachim pull people around. And indulgences also pull you around. They like take you to different places, like you're here and it schleps you to, you know, a different place. And so once we rid ourselves of these two ideas of arrogance and indulgences, then we can go into Gan Eden. And these two are very connected. It's a vicious cycle because once you have Tithus, you have indulgences and desires. How do you get rid of it? By having bittel, by saying, I really want this. I really want to see this juicy piece of gossip. I really want to eat this really delicious thing. I really want to just stay in bed and not go help my friend. But when you nullify yourself, then you're able to, but if, if you have, if you have, um, if you have a desire to do something wrong, like I'd rather stay in bed, I'd rather say the mean comment, I'd rather gossip, what is going to help you get out of that is humility. Wait a second, why don't I look from her perspective? Why don't I look from Hashem's perspective? Why don't I look at what's really better to do instead of just, you know, what my arrogant self feels like doing right now. That's what an animal does, right? Instant gratification, I, self, what I want. Let me look beyond that. Well, it takes humility to look beyond yourself. And so if a person is having indulgences and they also have gaiva, they also have arrogance, they're just going to keep them be stuck in that vicious cycle. But I could break that by having bitto, by... Um, by having some humility. So we're ending off here. We, we finished the topic, finally. So next class, we're going to start a new topic. But we're ending off here with this, you know, theme that we've seen throughout of bittel, of nullifying. If we really want to serve Hashem, it can't be all about me. It has to be about Hashem or the Taira or the other person. So that's a tremendous, tremendous lesson that we could, you know, end with is that 
when I really want to connect to Hashem, the key to feeling Hashem in my life, you know, some days it's the same day as another day when I just felt Hashem's presence more. Like I just saw the, the divine providence in my day. I just felt like Hashem was guiding me in other days, not. So what's the trick to have more of those days when you really feel Hashem and you feel connected and you, when you have this nullification and you say like, you know, well, what does Hashem want? Let me, let me talk to him. Let me learn something. Let me not just think about myself, but think about, you know, have some humility here that invites Hashem in. And you say, I'm not going to do what just feels good for my body, but I'm going to do what's a higher purpose. That bitl, that nullification is going to allow Hashem into your life. So we have a couple of minutes. If anyone has any questions, um, you know, on this topic at all, because we're going to start another topic next class, next week. Um, so I'm still not sure exactly why is it that they didn't want to eat from the tree of life? It was because they wanted to be bitter or, or, or what no, was that? No, they, he wanted to toil. He says, I don't want to just have a magic trick and I know all of Tyra. I want to learn Tyra and really immerse myself in it and learn it on my own. All right, I don't want you to just give me a free encyclopedia that has everything in it. I want to oh, okay, okay. earn it. So, but I thought the tree of life was to live forever. So that's different than learning Torah. Right, but it also says, um, Tyra, yeah, it also says, um, Tyra, he, that it also says that Tyra is like our life. It says, Estako Barais of our Oma, Hashem looked in the Tyra and he created the world that everything has sustenance, the whole world and us all have sustenance, you know, through Tyra. That's why when um, David didn't want to be killed he said i'm going to be learning tyra saying words of tyra and then hashem you know so tyra is our source of life so when it says source of life the deeper meaning yes also it, it's both it gave them life but also would give them all the secrets of tyra any other questions i have one yes go ahead can you hear me yes um, andrew i hear you thank you uh we usually attribute the apple right to the tree of knowledge yeah, and we discussed many classes ago that that's false information. We said it could be a pomegranate. We said it could be, um, you know, we gave a bunch of different answers, a fig. We right, I remember that. Was there, not an was there an assignment for the tree of, of life to a particular fruit? Uh, no, not that I know of. Not that I know of, no. But the apple is just, you know, one artist maybe many years ago put an apple and... It's it's not accurate information. Okay, I'm just curious. <laughs> I know. Sorry to burst people's you know all the cartoons that you've seen or whatever. Okay, thank you. Look forward to seeing you all next week. Have a wonderful show. Thank you.